Anybody need some water before we begin? Good. Okay. I have. Okay. Here we go, everybody. We have seen the great attributes that the children of Israel achieved, and we also have uh, seen all the incredible miracles, the 40 miracles that took place. Hopefully this made an impression upon us, made an impression upon me about the experience, just the experience of being at Sinai. As we know, we say in the Haggadah, if we only just came before Mount Sinai, it would have been enough. Even without receiving the Torah, it would have been enough because of everything that we experienced. Okay, so now... Before we actually embark on examining closely and understanding each of the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> tonight we'll spend some time looking at the structure of the Ten Commandments. So let's begin page 407. Let's see the Ten Commandments inside. We read them. <clears throat> chapter 20 in the book of Exodus. Good thing to know. Exodus chapter 20. Okay, everybody have it? Page 407. God spoke all these statements saying, I am Hashem, your God. What does that mean? He spoke all these statements? Together. At the same time. At the same time. The ultimate at the same time. Okay, go ahead. Number I, one. I am Hashem, your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Okay, so number one, we see God is introducing himself. I am Hashem, your God. We'll have to examine what those two things are. And God tells us, you want to know a little bit about me? I took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Okay? We had mentioned one of the questions. If God wants to tell us something impressive, who he is, he could have said something which is far more remarkable, which is creation. Okay? That's number one. Number two. <clears throat> You shall not recognize the gods of others in my presence. And where is God's presence? Everywhere. Everywhere. Correct. <clears throat> you shall not make yourself a carved image nor any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the water beneath the earth. You shall not prostrate yourself to them nor worship them for I am Hashem, your God, a jealous God who visits the sin of fathers upon children to the third and fourth generations for my enemies. Okay, so hold on. So here we see, can't recognize the philosophies, ideologies, what others consider to be gods. Number one. Number two, we don't make any image or likeness. Number three, we're not to prostrate. Number four, we're not to worship. These are four separate mitzvos of the 613 mitzvahs, but they are considered one of the so-called commandments. The 10 commandments are really 10 statements. So this is one statement. All of this is one statement. We have to know what's the meaning of all of these four prohibitions. What does it mean God is jealous? Why does he visit the sins of the fathers? Okay, that's what we're gonna do when we examine it further. Go ahead, verse six. But who shows kindness for thousands of generations to those who love me and observe my commandments? Okay, that's the end of commandment number two. Wow. That was all number two. Now, number three. <clears throat> you shall not take the name of Hashem, your God, in vain, for Hashem will not absolve anyone who takes his name in vain. Okay, that's number three. Now we go to number four. <clears throat> Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Six days shall you work and accomplish all your work, but the seventh day is Sabbath to Hashem, your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your slave, your maidservant, your animal, and your covenant 
and your convert, sorry, uh, within your gates. Now, what kind of a convert are they talking about? If a person converts to Judaism, they're no different than any other Jew. So it's referring to someone who has accepted upon themselves to denounce idolatry, but they have not converted to Judaism. Mm -hmm. There is such such a thing. That's that's a ger toshav. That's called in Israel. They they will they they recognize the one true God and follow the seven mitzvahs that were given to Noah and his sons. That's who it's referring to here. Go ahead. For in six days Hashem made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and He rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Hashem blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. That's number four. Here, we also have to examine <clears throat> how do we sanctify the seventh day? Why does God tell us in verse nine that we should work for six days? And what if you don't want to work? Fred, you work, you're retired, aren't you? You don't work anymore. Okay. What? <laughs> okay. Well, we have to work for six days and everything. What is all this? And here in verse 11, it tells us that the concept of the Sabbath is that God made the universe in six days. He rested on the seventh. And yet in the book of Deuteronomy, there God says, because I took you out of the land of Egypt. It says something totally different. We will examine all of this. Okay. Number five. Honor your father and your mother so that your days will be lengthened upon the land that Hashem, your God, gives you. Now, do we need to come to Sinai to tell us that we should show respect for our parents? A person who doesn't show respect for their parents is an ingrate that has issues. Look, it's not a human being. We had to come to Sinai for this. Not only that, so that was number five. Now let's number six. You shall not kill. Got to go to Sinai for that. You shall <laughs> not commit adultery. That's number seven. You shall not steal. Which means really kidnapping here. Here it's referring to kidnapping, stealing a human being. Okay. You shall not bear false witness against your fellow. That's number nine. And number 10. You shall not <clears throat> covet your fellow's house. You shall not covet your fellow's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your fellow. Okay, now didn't it just say that you should not commit adultery? So what does it mean not to covet your fellow's wife? All of this we will see when we examine this more closely. So we went through the Ten Commandments. As it says in the very first commandment, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. And we pointed out, we said this last week a few times in Hebrew, that is singular. I had a singular. I am the Lord your God who took you, not y'all, but you, you, you. God's talking to the individual. How come here it's in the singular and everywhere else it's in the plural? As we say in the last verse of Shema, I am the Lord, the God of all of you. Asher. I'd say, see, Eschem, I took all of you out. Why is this singular? So number one, we mentioned last week, we said that God is attaching his name at this point to each and every individual. Why is that significant? That is significant because God does not attach his name unto the living, because as long as we are alive and we have the struggle of dealing with the evil inclination, we can fall victim. Even if a person has been righteous their whole life, it's possible that they will fall victim to the web of sin that the evil inclination prepares for us. So God never attaches his name. Here, God attached his name to each individual. Why? Because as we said, when we stood at Sinai, the stench of the sin of the serpent from the Garden of Eden and even the evil inclination was removed from within us. We returned to the pristine state of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden prior to their sin. We did not possess at that point the evil inclination. When did it come back? Came back, well, yeah, it came back with the golden calf. Before that, we said it came back. But we said to Moshe, Moshe, we can't hear the sound of God our souls are leaving our bodies. We covered this last week. Our souls are leaving our bodies. 
We are experiencing death. God resurrected. It's too much. You deliver the word of God to us. And with that, we fell a little bit now our left. So God attached his name. Not only that, but by God presenting this in the singular, he is telling us that the responsibility of the Ten Commandments is not a communal responsibility. You know, we have certain, certain mitzvahs are communal. For example, we're supposed to read the portion of the week from the Torah scroll every week. Is that an obligation on each individual? No, it's an obligation on the community. So if for whatever reason, a person didn't hear the reading of the Torah, but the community did. We had enough people to bring, take out the Torah and to read it. We fulfilled the communal responsibility. The Ten Commandments, we cannot say, well, okay, so listen, I'll, 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 I'll keep two or three of them. But, you know, most of the people keep ten, so we're okay. Ninety percent of the people are keeping the Ten Commandments. Ten percent maybe have a little sort of trouble with it. That's, a, that's okay, isn't it? No, the Ten Commandments are a responsibility for each, each individual. Every individual is obligated. Every individual will be judged. Okay? Now, when we say, though, will be judged, one thing we see elsewhere is that God does consider the environment in which we exist. In other words... If, if we live in a cesspool, <laughs> if we live in a society which is so deranged and depraved, that is absolutely taken into consideration. Okay, so this is how God judges us. In addition, it's presented to the individual because each individual who upholds these Ten Commandments that we heard at Sinai, we can sustain the entire world. The whole world is worth existing, the whole universe, if even for one person. That means if the entire world becomes so thoroughly corrupt that there is absolutely, there's, there's like the, as when did it happen? We had a time like that. It happened at the time of the, well, Sodom and Gomorrah for them and also by the flood, generation of the flood. The whole world was so totally corrupt but the world was worth re retaining the universe because of Noah and his family. Few people, less than a million. How many people were there in the ark? Eight. Eight. Eight? Absolutely one right. Eight. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Plus one on top. And one. Oh, Fred. Very good. They say Og was hanging on to the top, to the roof. Very good. Okay. Let's go to page 1287. We're not going any further than this. You know why? Because there is nothing further than this. This is the book of Ecclesiastes. Who wrote Ecclesiastes? Who? King Solomon. Very good. King Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. And you have some of the greatest wisdom that is contained. So page 1287. When we are, he's almost finished, chapter 12, verse 13. Okay? Verse 13, after all of the incredible insight and wisdom of King Solomon, and he wrote this in his later years, his later years, so verse 13 on page 1287, what does he say? The sum of the matter, when all has been considered, fear God and keep his commandments, for that is man's whole duty. Okay. In Hebrew, sof dova means the, the end, the end of everything, purpose, the goal, the end of it all is that akol nishma, everything is heard, everything is recorded, everything is known. And what is our responsibility? As well, ekim yurah, that we should, yurah means fear, but it doesn't mean to be afraid. Whenever we see fear, it doesn't mean to be afraid of God, it means to be in awe. To be in awe, I'm overwhelmed. To be in awe of God and his commandments, we should observe. Why? This is the totality, the whole of man. See, he translates here, it's man's duty, which it certainly is. But literally, it means this is the whole man. What does that mean? It means that the 
purpose, the totality of a human existence is to know, be awed, and observe God's will. That's it. Somebody asks you, why are we here? Why did God create us? He doesn't need us. No, he doesn't. He created us so that we would have the incredible opportunity to know him and be awed by him and thereby accept the responsibility of observing all of his, his mitzvahs, his commandments, his instructions. That's the totality of man. And that's God is presenting this to each and every individual, not mankind, each and every one of us. That's why it's in the singular. Let's look at the content of the Ten Commandments. So we just went through the Ten Commandments. And if we look at the content, our sages tell us in the, in the Midrashim that when we heard, for example, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery, when we heard the six, the Ten Commandments, all 613 mitzvahs that are found in the Torah are included and found within the Ten Commandments. The first two we heard directly from God. I am the Lord your God. Should not have any other the gods of others. Don't do this. Don't prostrate. Don't serve. Don't worship and everything. These two we heard directly from God for these form the essence of Yahadus. What's Yahadus? Judaism. The essence of Judaism. Think about it. I am the Lord your God. What does that mean? It means there is a God. You get into conversations with some people and they'll talk about this, talk about that. Like, wait a second, wait a second. You want to have a little discussion? Here's where it starts and here's where it ends. Do you believe that there is a God? And if you say yes, what is your concept of God? You want to know the Jewish concept? Ask the ladies who came to the class on the 13 principles. That's what the 13 principles of our faith is all about. Understanding God. Okay, what God is, what God isn't. Number one, there's God. Number two, he's, I am the Lord, your God. We've got a special connection. Number three, do you know what it is that I want to do? I want to perform loving kindness. One proof, took you out of Egypt, the house of slavery. I didn't put you there. Man did that. I took you out. Yeah, but where were you? Why did you allow it to happen? Good question. Good question. How could God allow the Holocaust? What else? Good question. God didn't make the Holocaust. Let's not forget who made the Holocaust. Man, utilizing all of his scientific knowledge, all that he had achieved in 20 centuries. Man, okay? Right, it's, it's a difficult, thing. we're not going to discuss it now. God is telling us, number one, I am, and there's nothing else. There is, there exists nothing else. There's no other deity. There's no other philosophy. There's no other ideology. It, it doesn't exist. It's not the truth. Doesn't mean that it's evil. I'm not saying that. But there is just one concept. There is one God. Now, I'm not saying that all human beings have to observe all 613 minutes because they do not. They do not. Jewish people were given this at Sinai. Others do not. But all human beings have a responsibility to recognize there is one true creator. Okay? So the first two are the essential. There is a creator. He is our patron. He takes care of us. He provides for us. He shows us his love. And with that, we should be filled with a feeling of submission. This is, this is the one who brought me into this world, who cares for me, who loves me, who does all of this. This is the creator. I submit myself before him and therefore included in this mitzvah of I am the Lord your God means that I have a feeling of love for God. You know, one of the 613 mitzvahs is that we should feel love for God. What do we say that? 
the neshma, the ahav to Eis Hashem Alekecha, you should love the Lord your God. It's a mitzvah. It's included here. There's a mitzvah to pray to God. Because if I have a concept that there exists a God and he loves me and he has a special relationship, he wants to hear from me. Why don't you, have, you, have, you bring a child into this world? You want to hear from them. You'd like to have them call, pick up a phone and call you every six months. <laughs> okay? There's a mitzvah that we should be in awe of God. There's a mitzvah that we should sanctify his name because if we have a concept of God, it exists. There's a mitzvah of performing kindness one to the other because God performs kindness. What a role model. We also can learn the mitzvah of eating matzah, of the mitzvah of sitting in a sukkah and tefillin. Why? Because all of these mitzvahs are to remind us of to God taking us out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, which means, think about that. I took you out of Egypt. And I took you out of Egypt, and we ate the matzah, so we ate matzah. And then we ate the morrow, we have the morrow. And everything that's involved. And God had us dwell, but he took us out. We had we were enveloped by the clouds of glory. We had sukkahs, we do that. And the tefillin themselves. The mitzvah of tefillin was given to us before we came to Sinai. It was given to us before the Seder night. This is a sign, the sign on our arms and ahead, the tefillin is a sign of this bond that we have with God who took us out of Egypt. So all of these mitzvahs, and many, many more, I'm not going to list 30 mitzvahs here, all of these mitzvahs were included and perceived by Qal Yisrael. When it said that we should not uh, have the gods of others, it included all the mitzvahs that deal with idolatry. When it speaks about the third of the commandments, that we should not say God's name in vain, it's also teaching us that what we say is potent and therefore we should be careful when we take an oath, a vow, and even when we speak, we should make sure that we, what we speak is kosher. How could you have speech that's not kosher? What do you call speech that's not kosher? Lashon Hara, that's correct. As the old saying goes, we have to make sure not only what goes in our mouths is kosher, but what comes out of the mouth is kosher. We have the Shabbos, the fourth mitzvah. The Shabbos tells us that there are special sacred days. It's also alluding to other days that are referred to in the Bible, the Torah, as Shabbos, such as Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. One of the questions that we asked when we first got together is that aren't, do I need to come to Sinai to know that I should honor my parents? I shouldn't kill. I shouldn't commit adultery. I shouldn't kidnap. I need to go to Sinai for that? Isn't it obvious? The answer is no, it's not obvious. Number one, it's not obvious because we see what goes on. But number two, it's not obvious because it wasn't just don't kill. But when we go into this in depth, we will see, you know what's included in don't kill? Euthanasia, abortion. Things that people can make very strong, valid arguments that should be permissible. I wouldn't know that it's problematic if I did not go to Sinai. When we go further, we will see how that's included. I don't want to do that all now. We'll do that when we examine. But when we came to Sinai and heard this, the content was not just these 10 commandments or these 14 mitzvahs included, all 613 were involved. In addition, there's much that was concealed. In the 10 commandments that we just read in Hebrew, there are 620 letters. 620 letters. What does that represent? So we had mentioned once before that it's a 613 mitzvahs. And also the seven mitzvahs that were given to Noah that the Gentile world is also uh, responsible for. But in addition, <clears throat> in the Zohar, it states that it refers to the 613 mitzvahs plus the seven days of creation. Now, what is that? Do I understand the 613 mitzvahs and the seven Noahide mitzvahs? Those are all mitzvahs. That's referring to our obligation, what we're supposed to do. What are the mitzvahs, the 613, have to do with the seven days of creation? Well, what's that all about? 
So we will see, first of all, there's a medrash that says, Bereshis Borelikin. This word bracious is a very unique word. You rarely find it. It means bereshis in the beginning of. In the beginning of creation, God created, said, uh, the beginning of the creation, heavens and earth, let there be light and everything. But we find that the Torah is referred to as racious. Racious means the start, the beginning. There are verses which indicate that the Torah itself, and it says, Beresh is barley kim. God created the universe with racious, with and for his Torah. This entire universe that God created is for man. And man, the totality of man is achieved when he has the Torah. So the Ten Commandments, when we receive the Torah and the 613 mitzvahs, is indeed connected to creation. Because our receiving these Ten Commandments and this Torah is the purpose of creation. In addition, 620 equals, I think we mentioned this also a while ago, equals the word keser. Tough is 400, resh is 200, that's 600, and tough is 20, and keser means a crown. Keter, crown. For indeed, these 620 letters that comprise the Ten Commandments that was given to each individual, that's your crown. That's our crown that we win. So there's 620 letters. There are 172 words. 172 words. 172 is spelled kuf is 100. Ayin, 70. Base is to 172. Spells the word akev. What's significant about that? So let's go to page 127 in Genesis chapter 25. Page 127, chapter 25, verse 26. This is talking about the birth of Yaakov and Esau. Okay. Why was he called Yaakov? Anybody know why he was called Yaakov? Because Esau came out of his mother first, and Yaakov was holding on to his heel. So we understand that to mean that I should be the first. You preceded me. It's like I'm trying to hold them back. Okay, let's see. Go ahead. Verse 26. <clears throat> After that, his brother emerged with his hand grasping on to the heel of Esau. So he called his name Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Okay. What does Jacob have to do with his holding on to the heel? Because the Hebrew word for heel is... Akev. Akev. Akev means at the end. So the, the bottom of a person is the heel. That's the bottom. So Yaakov was holding on to Esau's Akev. Now that we know something about Akev, what do you think that means? Akev, what is Akev? The 172 words of the Ten Commandments. So what does it mean that Esau's born and Yaakov didn't hold on to his ankle, not his calf, not his foot, his heel? Why his heel? Because Esau, it represents the Ten Commandments. Esau, you, I know who and what you are, and you and your nature is such that you will reject the Ten Commandments. And indeed he did. We learned that God offered the Ten Commandments to Esav and he rejected it. He was saying that, no, you, you're the ache of, you should not receive them. Let's go to page 129, next page. We want verse five. <clears throat> this is here, this is talking about where there was a famine and now Yitzchak has to leave where he was in Hebron. He's thinking of going down to Egypt like his father, and God tells him, no, don't go there. Go to the, uh, go, go east. 
by the place of the Philistines in Israel. So let's see verse 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and observed my safeguards, my commandments, my decrees, and my Torahs. Therefore, I promised him this land. You do not leave this land. The word because. In Hebrew, if you look at the verse, it says, Ekev asher shoma avraham. Ekev can mean on behalf of, cause. Ekev that Avraham listened to my Torah's decrees, commandments, safeguards, all of these things. I gave him this land and you stay in this land. Strange word, Ekev. What is God telling us? That Avraham observed everything of the Ekev, the 172 words, the Ten Commandments. Even before the Torah was given, Avraham had knowledge of it. Let's go to page 113. Because it refers to the written and the oral. Okay? 113. Avraham sends Eliezer, his servant, to find the bride, the proper bride, the next matriarch of Israel for his son Yitzchak. Eliezer comes and he meets Rivka, who happens to be Avraham's niece, cousin to Yitzchak. And he wants to see if she is a woman of great kindness and wisdom, and she certainly is. And when he notices this and he prayed to God that his prayer was answered. So let's take a look at verse 22. And it was when the camels had finished drinking, the man took a golden nose ring. Its weight was a becca and two bracelets on her arms. Ten gold shekels was their weight. Okay. So he took or gave her a ring. I guess they wore nose rings. Okay. And bracelets. And its weight was a becca. What's a becca? A becca is beys. How you spell it? Beys. Kruf. Bye. Becca is the word Aiken backwards. Why is it important for the Torah to tell us? He gave her the rings and he gave her the bracelets. Very nice. Why does that have to tell us it's Becca? Becca is telling you its weight. Our sages say because what he was giving to Rivka, he was saying to Rivka, what I have in store for you requires your commitment to the 172 words. Commitment to God's Torah. That's what he was conveying. Okay? So 172 words. Here we see Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov all new, influenced, committed to this. Now, something else which is very interesting. Let's go back to 407. Okay, that's where we started, 407. The, ver the verse, actually, we need to do the Hebrew. So I'll do the Hebrew in 406, verse 1. By Yadabar Elaikim, Eskola Dvarma Ela Lemar. God spoke all these statements saying, how many words in this verse? How many Hebrew words? Seven. Seven. How many letters? 28, it's on the board. <laughs> there are seven words in this verse, 28 letters. Okay, let's go to Genesis 1. 1. Let's go to the very first verse in Genesis. And that's on page 3 or page 2. Chapter 1, verse 1 begins on page 2. That's it. Okay, page two, we'll do the Hebrew here also. It says, Bereshis Barale Kim, beginning of God's creative creation of Asa Shemayim Yisrael. How many words? Seven. How many letters? 28. 28. We see a relationship between the Ten Commandments because God, when he spoke all these words, he spoke all the Ten Commandments at one time. The Ten Commandments and creation. It's Ten Commandments and creation. Okay. In addition, 
one of the most sacred communal responses that we have, especially somebody is saying a Kaddish. Kaddish is a prayer that we say for someone who has died, loved one who has died, and it's a special prayer. It's also said elsewhere. And then there's a point in which the congregation responds, Amen, Yehei, Shmei, Rabba, Mavorach, Olam, Umei, Umei. Take out the Amen. So maybe, what do we have? Yehei, Shmei, Rabba, Mavorach, Olam, Omei, Omei. Seven words. When the congregation answers this together, it is powerful. The impact is for the soul of the deceased. It's for the soul of the deceased. That's why the Kaddish, people say, well, I'll, I'll say Kaddish at home. You can do that, but you're missing the whole, the whole advantage, the whole, the whole impact of the Kaddish is when the congregation responds. What does it mean? May God's great name be blessed. That means it should be acknowledged in this world, in the worlds, in all the worlds. One day we'll talk about that. We did around 35 years ago. We can do it again. <laughs> I think it's time. We'll talk about that also. Seven words, 28 letters. When is this point in time in which God's name will be blessed in all the worlds? That's referring to the Messianic era. That's why it's in future tense, the whole Kaddish. Yiskadal, Yiskadash. God's name will be great. It will, it will be sanctified. It's all in future tense. What is the whole idea of the seven words and 28 letters? Seven is the number that represents the totality of all that is contained within the physical existence. That's why seven is such a prevalent number. Seven days to the week, seven, seven blessings for a bride and groom, seven days of mourning, seven days biblically of Passover, seven days to Sukkot, then you have Shemini Atzeres, a different Yontif. Seven is that number. We find seven, seven years until you come to the sabbatical year. Seven sabbatical year cycles until you come to the jubilee year. There's more sevens. There's seven notes to the to the music. There's seven seven layers of the spheres, the atmosphere, troposphere, ionosphere, stratosphere, all of that. There's seven. Seven heavens, as we say. So what we say, seven notes, seven colors in the rainbow, right? Roy G. Biv, exactly. I mean, we find seven. I think there's seven continents, too, if I'm not mistaken. There's seven great bodies of water. Seven is a very, very prevalent number. Everything Rabbi Samson Rafa Hirsch says, everything in this world is contained within the realm of seven. After seven, we begin again. The number eight represents transcending the limitations of the physical world. That's why the mitzvah of circumcision, Brismil, is on the Eighth day, eighth day, Hanukkah, eight days. Okay, so seven represents the physical world. What is 28? The Hebrew word for 28 is chof ches, the Hebrew letters. Chof is 20, ches is eight. What does chof ches spell? Koach. What does koach mean? Strength. Strength. That is correct. So everything that is found within the physical material world can be found within these seven words that are introducing the Ten Commandments. That means everything that exists in the physical world can be found in the Ten Commandments. This is an incredible statement. That means magnetism. If one understands properly the depth of the Ten Commandments, you'll know magnetism. We'll know all about energy, we'll know all about physics, we'll all know all about medicine, everything. It's there. But now we're talking about the select few throughout the generations who have that instinct. And what is the 28th the strength? It means that with the Ten Commandments, we will have the strength to decipher the proper path for our success and happiness in this physical material did I lose you? you? Are we good? Would you repeat that, please? Okay. Seven represents the material world that we live. 
And all knowledge of this material world is found in the Ten Commandments, symbolized by the seven words that introduce the Ten Commandments. And there are 28 letters, the number 28, when it's spelled, has a meaning, and it means straight. And that is, the 28 letters of the introducing the Ten Commandments tell us this is where we will find the strength to navigate the material world to find our happiness and success. That's pretty good stuff. I don't know about yeah. you, but I'm, I'm impressed with it. It's not mine. Very impressed. Okay. Let's take a look at the order of the Ten Commandments. We went through the Ten Commandments. There's an order to them. First of all, we have to know that there's a benevolent king. Number one. Number two, we should have an exclusive bond with this benevolent king. Shouldn't have the worship this, um, pray to this, make an image here. Number three, this incredible benevolent king who is our creator, we should revere his name. You don't want to hear people speaking bad about a loved one. You don't want to hear them using that. We should feel terrible when we hear the name of God being used. Some people, the only time they say God's name is when it's followed by some curse word. <laughs> but number four, we should have a day in which we're going to put aside our own personal pursuits and focus on our king, our benevolent king, our creator, our father. Number five, we should revere our elders. Why? Why? What is that doing over here? Because with every generation, they're further and further from Sinai. And every generation is like, well, how do I know what happened in the past? I mean, why? What, what is this? I, I, I wasn't there. I don't know about it. Who's going to be the instrument of God to connect the present generation with the past? That's parents. That's why we'll see that there are Ten Commandments, two tablets, five here, five there. The first five are about God. No God, Susaban, honor his name, a day to focus about God. Well, what about parents? Well, that's, that's dealing with God. That's dealing with human beings. It should have been on the other uh, section. The ones that say, don't kill a human being, don't uh, adultery, don't do this. The second five are dealing with our social responsibilities. The answer is elders, parents, they're the ones who transmit the knowledge and the history, enabling us to connect one generation to the next. And especially parents who we like to think are well-adjusted and love their children and want to give them the truth and children trust them and feel safe and secure. And then the children hear this from their parents. Yeah, it's got to be true. My, my mother wouldn't lie to me, would she? My father? Why would they be telling me this? So they, they transmit and the children realize we're another link in this remarkable chain. That's number five. Number six, not to kill. This is teaching us about the sanctity of life. Number seven, morality and the sanctity of marriage. Number eight, we're not supposed to kidnap. This teaches us the dignity of another human being. Another human being is not a commodity. A human being is incredible. Number nine, don't bear false witness. Our words, what we say should be sacred. Person says something, today you need a lawyer for everything you do. But there was a time you would put out your hand, the handshake, and that's the end of it. Number 10, don't covet. It means that our happiness and success is not found in material possessions. It's found in wisdom. This is the order of what the Ten Commandments are showing us. Now, the last thing, let's see if I can do this in two, three minutes. God gave us the Ten Commandments. He didn't give us one big, one big tablet with all ten. He gave us, he didn't give us three. He gave us two. And it wasn't six and four, seven and three, five and five. Why five and five? So Yachar and other commentaries say, because they're a match. Five on this side are a match to that. What does that mean? It means <clears throat> don't kill. Why not? He needed killing. So they what they <laughs> came before the judge. Why did you kill them? He needed killing. <laughs> what? Well, what did they kill? Yeah, a human being was created in the image of God. What does that mean? It means there's godliness and greatness. 
It's there within every human being. It has nothing to do with their education or their possessions. You could have the most educated people who have the greatest appreciation and they can be Nazis. And you can have people who, who are illiterate and they can be the finest, most wonderful human being. Every human being, we should see in every human being, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. This individual, we're going to take this person. God is talking to him as such a bond. We're going to kill that person. Then it tells us that we should not commit adultery. Now, it doesn't talk about other ancestral relationships, but specifically adultery, because this bond of marriage is sacred. It's a bond. It's a commitment. And you should not have the gods of others because we have a bond of marriage with God. They're connected. Third is that God tells us, don't use my name in vain. If you have true respect and reverence for a person, individual, you don't, you want, you don't want to besmirch their reputation. You don't want to use them as an object of your, your jokes or whatever it might be. So there's a dignity to a human being and to a person, a title. Don't kidnap, don't steal, don't steal another human being. There's dignity, we should have a respect. Not only is there godliness that we shouldn't take the life, there should be respect for a human being, his title. Who are you? You know what the title of a person is? I'm a human being. I'm not a number. Who remembers the prisoner? Anybody remember the prisoner? Yeah. Remember that? That was one of the finest television shows. Chapter, 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 chapter. <laughs> so here. What? That's correct. He basically he was some spy that he put whatever it is, and they took him and you're not you have no name, you're a number. That's what the Nazis did. You're a number, boom, right on your arm. You're a number. Dehumanizing a person. You're a number. Well, no, this tells us that man is not a number. The Shabbos, what is the Shabbos all about? What does the Shabbos have to do with you should not bear false witness? The Shabbos is a day of testimony. Observing the Shabbos is how we testify that there is a creator who is the master and in control of everything. Shabbos is called the day of testimony. When we examine this more deeply, we'll explain this further. Shabbos is a day of testimony. Make sure our testimony is appropriate. And finally, should not covet. What does it have to do with respecting parents? Because as we said, not to covet, if we want to find true happiness and success, it's not found in the pursuit of material, but rather it's found in the wisdom and the sagacity of those who have experience in this world. Our parents, our grandparents, our elders, our sages. So the five on this side correspond perfectly. They are congruous with the five on the other side. So now we have a bit of the structure of the Ten Commandments. Next week, we will not meet. It's right after Purim. We all have to recuperate. <laughs> <laughs> the following week, we will not meet because my wife is schlepping me to a wedding. So, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> And so God willing, after that, maybe we'll come together for one more before Pesach, or maybe we'll see, maybe we'll resume after Pesach. So I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. It was great. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you.